Hello and welcome to The Future of Being Human Unplugged. My name is Andrew Maynard. I'm a professor of advanced technology transitions at, I'm going to say that again, I'm a professor of advanced technology transitions at Arizona State University and I'm also director of ASU's Future of Being Human initiative. Today, it is my huge pleasure to have the incredible Victoria Modesta as my guest. And we should probably bring Victoria in. Hi, Victoria. Hello. So I've, I've, I've got a few embarrassing things to say about you just to introduce you so everybody knows who you are. Um, <laughs> it's Victor better that you do it than me. <laughs> you know, this is the bit that I always hate when I, I do things. It's I, I wish people would just hurry on through it. But anyway, Victoria is a bionic pop artist, a creative director, a musician, a dancer and a champion of future innovations. Um, she first stepped onto the global stage, and I actually I need to ask you whether this really is true that this was really your first big global break. It may not be, but but certainly in terms of my notes, um, you stepped onto the global stage with a quite stunning performance at the London 2012 Paralympic closing ceremony, which I believe you were there along with Coldplay. That's correct. That's right. They were yes. my uh, backing band, <laughs> which is not bad. Um, this was followed by her truly compelling and thought-provoking viral music and art video prototype, which was commissioned by Channel 4 in the UK. Um, in addition to her work as a performing artist, she was an MIT Media Lab Directors Fellow in the 2016 cohort, a member of the 2019 class of Young European Leaders, and she's an ambassador for the Accessibility Space Initiative Mission Astro Access. And um, Victoria's latest project um, is with the uh, Aurelia Institute, um, and this tapped into a new frontier of body augmentation in microgravity through tech wearables and architectural fashion, which is something we'll get into in a minute. So Victoria, again, welcome. This is fantastic to have you on the broadcast. Thank you. And, Thanks and for I've, having me. And, and I've got to say, I, and so this actually goes back to a um, conversation we had with um, the astronaut Katie Coleman, which was a long time ago now where we began to talk about um, your work and your thinking around the, the future and human augmentation and technology beyond it. And I've been dying to extend that conversation ever since that. So this is... Me very, too. Me too. I, I'm good. I was going to say this was very indulgent for me, but I, I'm glad we're, we're both together with that. So I actually wanted to start off with um, a video. So I'm just going to pop this up. Up, and I want you to talk through what we're actually seeing here. So let's get this up on the screen. Um, what is this? Yeah, so this was my second opportunity of being in zero gravity. And, you know, this was one step towards a more conceptual kind of way of being in microgravity and also like embodying it. Mm. Um, and it's really interesting now that you're showing this, the first thing that came to my mind is that, wow, it's so challenging to take the conversation into a very sort of open, free thinking, creative area when it comes to the body and technology. Yep. There's so much, you know, there's just so much stuff that just seems like immovable when it comes to, you know, thinking about disability, thinking about technology and and so that was just a very unique opportunity to really just leave all of that behind at home. <laughs> right, right. And I, so this was, correct me if I'm wrong, the second time you had been up on a parabolic flight? Yeah, yeah, it was. So, um, so you know, I joined Mission Astro Access as an ambassador, um, I guess it's almost two years ago now, you know, and they did the very first flight, which was... Um, really pretty historical because obviously the research around um, sort of alternative mobility in microgravity has been very minimal. Yes. Um, that's what the old thinking that you need classic earth style are, mobility. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I was going to say in, in space is not only you need sort of a two arms and two legs, but you also need to be a, a bulky white male as well, I believe. At least right. that was a historical thinking. <laughs> Right. So, so that was really historic, you know, and I had the pleasure of going up there with, you know, some amazing ambassadors, like mm -hmm. people that, you know, even whatever, however much knowledge I have around sort of alternative body and, and ability stuff, even I was kind of surprised. These yeah. are really high level folks that just 
taking their love, you know, lives to the extreme. And, and, and so that should, was the first. Yeah. yeah and I, I was going to say, we should say a little bit about what Astro Access does, um, because I, I suspect some people listening and thinking this is just a way of getting people up into zero G, but it's not. There's, there's a special part of this. Yeah, th there is, there is. So, you know, the research around uh, around limited mobility or alternative mobility in, mm -hmm. in microgravity has been so small and which, so, you know, George Whitesides uh, was one of the main people that kind of backed this project. Um, you know, bless him, just has such a, such an infinite kind heart for doing things that just seemed like the right thing to do, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, you know, so they interviewed um, a lot of, different types of folks who are quite a lot of them are within the aerospace um, area already, you know, myself, the only artist on board and really just to put us together on a flight and start the conversation around what is the reality of being in microgravity with these different types of physical conditions and augmentations and what is the future? You know, how does a nonprofit situation like that impact, you know, the larger scale of what the space industry is developing, how they're thinking, and and also the public perception? Because let's not forget right. that, you know, the the image and the PR. <laughs> right, right, right. So you were there as an an amputee, and and we should say a little bit about that, but also I. There are a wide range of what you might consider physical disabilities with amongst people on that flight. And this is the thing that blew me away when I learned about it. Um, even the idea of sending somebody up into space who is blind or, or into zero G who is blind or, or like you, you've got an augmentation on, on one of your limbs. It seems like you are completely rewriting the norms of what's uh, what is OK and what actually works up in that environment. Yeah. And what you know. It was a lot of, um, it was actually a, a pretty significant process of sort of getting into it and um, uh, getting to be part of that. And the, the reason why I got so incredibly excited is that, you know, being back on Earth and working within that space and advancing that conversation um, around the future of the body and ability, it's incredibly rigid and you always feel like every every direction you turn is like a glass ceiling and i think that what's interesting about space is that you are entering a completely new frontier a completely new environment a completely you know historically unconquered area where you can you can almost bypass a lot of the sort of um narrow-minded kind of thinking that exists right, back right. here right you can just be like all right let's just <laughs> let's just okay if somebody's questioning you know the intelligence or the ability or you know or you know are we ready for leadership from somebody you know that has a disability all of those kind of taboo questions you know then we sort of bypass that and then we're like kind of like well wait a minute you know what is what does a person like that with that sort of physicality function like when it comes to um, being in space? And, you know, the results were incredible. Um, I think we, we finished that first flight after tons and tons of experiments, you know, everything that we could possibly do in the time that we had with the understanding that if anything, you know, for somebody that struggles in their daily life, uh, really navigating the world that's just not built for them mm -hmm. um that just simply doesn't exist when you go right. out to space you yes. know your day of trying to find a ramp or a lift or moving yourself around or whatever you know for some some of the um members that were there you know who are in the wheelchair it's like you push yourself with one finger uh from you're there. the wall I, of the I, cabin and you're there <laughs> right right and I, so and, and one of the things that blew me away from this is just the realization that what is seen as a disability on earth becomes a, an ability in that environment um, but more than that as you said I this could be a blank slate where we actually design zero g environments for people of all abilities rather than just the stereotypical old people that went up 
Absolutely. Well, also, you know, uh, uh, some years ago, I had a really fun conversation with Professor Hugh Herr, you know, professor of biomechatronics. We were driving through the Jordan desert and uh, he was in a back seat and, you know, we were talking about just, you know, the casual kind of deep conversation of, um, of some of the things that, you know, we, we discussed and, and we were like, I wonder how much of your body needs to remain in order for you to still get a sense. Cause all I could right. see was his head in the back seat. Yep. And I was like, I, I was like, you know, maybe the head, just the head is he actually could be a, enough. Right, right. You know, and, you know, and he he has thought about this quite a lot. And, you know, we talked about the fact that a lot of the things like, you know, muscle atrophy and all these extra limbs and everything, the, the new type of astronaut for long distance space travel I think is going to be an entirely new archetype, right. right? Because we just, you know, you just can't get away from the fact that the values that yep. matter really change dramatically. So um, I, I really imagine a lot of people who don't find it that easy or that fun here in this, in this <laughs> vertical, uh, right, vertical right. perspective environment, you know, they'll be like, take me up to space, you know, yeah. why? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, at, at this point, I, I, I don't really want to dwell on this too much because there's so much else that I want to talk to you about. But just for the people that are uh, watching, give us a, a really quick backstory as to um, what your situation is and why you ended up on this, this flight with people with various disabilities. Yeah. Um, so, oh, it's see myself here there we go um so you know it's interesting like my my backstory really is sort of uh heavily dominant dominated by my health and mm -hmm. and unlike um unlike a lot of the things that we hear out there of people bringing up their health and you know part of their journey I think for me, it was just like a very unexpected key to um, transcend hardship. Mm -hmm. So I was born. I was born in. Um, I was born in Latvia when we still use SSR and had an accident at birth, and it was really kind of you know kind of a challenging situation. And through doctor's negligence, I actually ended up having um, quite a lot of damage done to my left leg. Mm -hmm. So then from age six till 12, I just had countless operations. I had lengthenings. I had, you know, um, one thing is done and spatter and then 10 other things to follow that, you know, that are, that are not so great. So, um, so that was kind of like my journey, but you know, there's a lot of other factors. I didn't really get to participate in education in the traditional way. I was sort of shielded like a kind of a lab animal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the time, really, in hospital, kind of left with my imagination and, you know, Disney right. as my parent. <laughs> um, so, so that I was, was, I was going to say, my, Disney, my... Disney actually did a pretty good job then. You know, like love it or hate it, I think, you know, you can't underestimate the power of storytelling and somebody telling right. you, look, things are right. things are super weird. You through motivation, hard work, and really strong desire, you can totally like transform your reality, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was really, that was really what happened with me. So in 99, um, my parents immigrated to UK and I went from like the extremes of hospitals and kind of, you know, quite surreal life where, you know, what I can only describe as a fairly psychedelic, transcendent, weird experiences, right? Where, <laughs> like later on in life discovering things like the Vipassana sort of meditation. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, understanding your body and overcoming different things and sort of trying to find some sort of balance. <laughs> I'm like, that's right. all I did, <laughs> right. you know? So, so then I moved to UK and, and I kind of got submerged um, in, in the London subculture scene, mm -hmm. which you know, as, as, 
as upsy and downsy and and kind of rock and roll as it was, you know, it was really powerful because it sort of showed to me the adult version of Disney of mm-hmm. way of being, right? Humans who really explore their life in a very conceptual way, who go out to the fringes of experiences, whether it's with body, with style, with society, with just trying to really experiment with identity, right? And and right. sort of what that means. And and that was all super, super useful. And then, you know, I got into a situation by my mid-teens where I was really facing another huge series of operations that were just never going to end. And it was not really clear what was going to happen. So that's when I decided that, you know, having, having the uh, power to be able to design my own prosthetics in my own part of my body and really just explore that away from the negative kind of let's just accept it. Right. So that was that was my that, little. That, that was the backstory, <laughs> but I I love that that concept of of being in control of your own body, designing your own body, and of course that's exactly what you've been experimenting with with your prosthetics. Um, I obviously through your art, but what I'm really fascinated um, with is how that has has changed your thinking about tech in the future, um, because in in our conversations. Um, you've really had a very profound perspective on how to think about the human body in a world where we can actually technologically augment it and and change who we are as far as our body goes. Yeah, you know, I mean, I fell into that in a somewhat accidental way, right? Because what I followed was kind of this sort of, you know, invisible passion and exploration and just wanting to figure out like what is the way to live life in a thriving kind of way you know mm-hmm. instead of sort of trying to deal with this thing and so by the time by the time my prototype video got released which was yeah. after the paralympics which the paralympics were definitely kind of like my, my first mainstream mm-hmm. um a kind of event um you know by the time that happened it was really the power of um the spread of information that I got in touch with people who are working on technology with people who are working on a much more kind of advanced body modification ideas who are just like, wait a minute, like you didn't realize that your entire like life philosophy, like completely, (laughs) completely aligns with, with this whole thing, you know, because for me, it was very sort of evolutionary instinctual. Like I didn't really, I didn't really have that sort of thing, but I think that, you know, the lesson there was just enormous because mm-hmm. it, it started making me see the intact potential uh, when it comes to technology and how we yep. apply that on the body and our life. And also, you know, I ended up like giving talks at schools and universities and stuff like right. that, which is a uh, uh, sort of schools of architecture rather. Mm-hmm. And, um, and thinking about design and technology from a perspective of embodiment and really a kind of, ca- I call it hyper embodiment. It's right. a kind of a, right. a, it's a thing that I've been exploring when you are thinking about it from that perspective and Mm. which is really the opposite perspective of consumer lifestyle goods right (laughs) so can you say a little bit more about that because i that that intrigues me so it it sounds like this is a a process of of taking control or taking ownership over your body um and, and sort of what you do with it and where you extend it rather than somebody forcing onto you what they want you to buy into yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's fairly limited in how much mm-hmm. control we do have over right. our body, <laughs> right? But I think that in our conscious waking life, there is so much opportunity. And I think that, you know, what I... It requires you to think in a non-rigid way and mm-hmm. not really be bound by you know, maybe even go- going to university and having like really right. sort of like, you know, the, there was at some point this kind of anarchic, chaotic way of how I think about things came really useful, right? Because right. 
if, if you're not paying attention to different disciplines, if you're not paying attention to, you know, disparities between different classes and different things and stuff, you sort of get into this place where you're experiencing all of it and exploring all of it from a very human experiential kind of way. Right. And, you know, and sometimes people sort of push back on it and think, you know, say, don't you know what the real world is? <laughs> and other times people are like, well, hell yeah, you know, cause like, that's how it should be. Right. Like when I first, um, when I first went for a visit to all of the rocket um, mm -hmm. sort of facilities, the first thing that came to my mind was like, wow, look at this attitude and method that happens in these, in these facilities where like no one really cares about like no one is like no one is trying to do anything there other than just find the fastest the best right the most very, efficient very narrow, yes right very narrow and you know i came in and i was like oh my god i'm like i wish there was a place where people did that you know for the research for the body hmm. right because there's just so much this is so much veil of like, you know, the medical stuff and all of this stuff. And there's all these barriers, but like, honestly, all of it is just kind of an illusion at that point. Right, right. So, so let's run with that. And I actually want to get back to something you said earlier about this idea of sort of embodiment and, and that experience you had with somebody in the back seat and you could just see their head. Um, so sort of what are the limits in your imagination here of, of body augmentation, um, at what point um, are we still enhancing who we are versus at what point are we at risk of losing who we are as we begin to redesign and re-engineer ourselves? I don't really know that we really get into a situation where we're sort of losing ourselves, right? right? Like one of, the, one of the things that through my experience that I've learned was that the more intentional I had to get about the architecture of my body and the function and how I'm going to do this or that or how I'm going to do an experiment is that it forces you to look further on the inside of well if my body doesn't define me who I am mm. then what does yes right and so you get so I think it all actually comes down to motivation and and I think that you know and you know, not, I'm hoping that the audience that, that's listening to this is kind of more familiar, you know, but I think, you know, kind of the difference between post-humanism and transhumanism, mm -hmm. right? There is, I, I, I feel that there is a very, there's a very wholesome way of thinking about technology and how, you know, we advance biotechnology and and you know and technology and our bodies and the world for a much more integrated interesting experience right and and then there is you know the opposite side of the things where it's a it's a much more of an egocentric sort of development right i want to live i want to live longer i want to i want to do this you know i want to run faster and like, and I think all of that is great. Mm -hmm. And, but to me, it's functional. Yeah. And beyond function, you know, I think that you really, with that kind of way of thinking, you're not really taking in the full picture of the possibilities. I, I love that. And actually, I, I hear so few people take this approach because everything seems to be either functional or transactional. How do you increase efficiency? As you said, how do you go faster? How do you live longer? But surely that isn't the essence that makes us who we are as humans. It's that there's something more to it. And I just listening to you um, as a as an artist and a, and a creative person, I, I think that that perspective seems so important in terms of getting to the core of what it is we're trying to do. What is truly important here? I mean, it all comes down to, you know, the masculine approach in the world has sort of dominated, right, historically. You don't and say. I think that, yes. <laughs> yes. you know, and, and, and like that is just, that is simply, that's what's happening. You know, when you look at, 
any field of futurism and design, you know, um, and it, it isn't about, it isn't about men and women. It is about really just finding space and strength in the feminine perspective and approach to mm -hmm. life and world. Right. And, and I do think that both men and women and, you know, any other identified gender is capable of that. You know, it's, right. it's more about a human quality as opposed to, um, sort of necessarily a gender. And I, and I think that that is, that's something that I came across a lot during my work and, you know, notoriously, a lot of my collaborations have been uh, gravitating towards working with people of a similar mind. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I think that that Aurelia um, experiment really was infused by that. Um, you know, Aurelia was uh, started as an initiative uh, by Ariel, um, you know, who's been running... Um, mm -hmm has been running the space initiative at MIT Media Lab, whose kind of values and heart is in just such a right place, you know, and she started the Aurelia initiative to give access to as many people as possible to really, you know, she understood that the value in having this diverse kind of pool of minds is mm -hmm. that they're able to interpret the world and problems and situations in a different way. Right. Right. And not many people are able to see. And so, so when I, when I, when I think about, you know, um, sort of the future of the, of the human body and, and it's interaction and culture. And, you know, I think that, I think that we're still hang up on the physicality, you know, right. we're still hang up on like, what does this person represent in this space walking in with their body versus, you know, what is this experience um, that they can bring to, you know, um, a situation? So, yeah. yeah. So I know, and I, I, I love that because I, I think it begins to change the way we, we talk about technology and think about technology and, and think about the future. So just running with that, um, from your perspective, I, how do you approach thinking about advanced technologies? I mean, we're living in a world now where the things we can do seem unbelievable compared to what we could do just a few years ago, whether you're looking at the abilities of artificial intelligence, whether you're looking at the fusion between that and robotics, whether you're looking at putting stuff into the body, whether it's brain-computer interfaces or other things, whether it's even manipulating our, our genetics. Um, our abilities to do stuff are incredible, but then how are bonkers? You... I <laughs> that I yes, I think that actually captures it way better than incredible. But but then how do you actually sort of bring your sort of sensibilities and uh, visions and perspectives into that world? How do you navigate around that so it doesn't just become how do we use these technologies to make us bigger and faster and and live longer? Yeah, so you know, f from my practice, the things that have become really important is um, one thing is to really make sure that you take time to step back and think about the larger implications of all of it, mm -hmm. you know, from a human development perspective and really just, it kind of comes down to values, you know, yeah. like I have, I have found myself just running off with a new, you know, a new creative tool or a new experience, you know, that's, just exponentially just stimulating and just like takes you out of the reality and right. you're just like you know and there's only so long you can do that until you realize that you're not using this very sophisticated biological computer mm, yes. that you live in in it in a way that is that engages it right and so I mean, it sounds kind of really cliche, but I have found that, you know, trying to connect the dots between some ancient knowledge and some ancient discoveries uh, and ancient science 
and all the types of different knowledge and practices that exist within understanding the human body and psyche and spirituality and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly important. Yep. It's incredibly important because, you know, while we're still living in this body, it doesn't matter how long you're trying to keep your attention outside of this physical experience and in something else, you will eventually realize that you have to come back and you have to deal with what's happening here because right. ultimately it's an escape, you know, and I had a really fascinating conversation with a Buddhist monk um, up in, um, in Japan and Mount Koyasan and you know, he's a futurist and it was just like a fascinating conversation and he could tell that, you know, his idea and investment of how important it is to develop technology and artificial intelligence, all of that stuff with the mind that it's there for a really long time. That's a right. really different type of thinking than you get in Silicon Valley, it for is. example. Yes. You know? But, but, but that's bizarre. <laughs> so, yes, you take the Silicon Valley mindset and it's all about sort of how do sort of a subset of humans live forever using technology. But nobody talks about the technology itself and how long that mm -hmm. goes and, and the time scale with which it actually impacts and influences us. It, yeah, no, totally. You know, and I and I think that you know a lot of people are trying are fighting really hard to get this balance between mm. you know it's like when people started creating plastic and when people started right. creating food that's bad for you, right? It's like it, it's taking the longest time to fight back from that and be like, well, just stop making it, like stop making the things that are really bad for you. Yeah. And I really feel like it's kind of similar with technology in a sense at the moment where, you know, it can be a very disassociative, mm -hmm. addictive experience, right? To have this kind of alternate experience. But ultimately, I think the part that I'm really excited about and, and I keep finding peers that are kind of in that mind frame is what happens when you integrate it? What happens when you yeah. harness technology and innovation and design to sort of maximize the human imagination, the human experience, the human lifestyle and human interaction. And, you know, and also just like make it a lot more well-rounded, you know, going back to masculine kind of feminine approach. Right. Um, I, I just, I just uh, had the most fascinating conversation with, um, with somebody at JPL who is talking, he was talking about, what it's like to prepare for a mission to search for life mm -hmm. on other planets. And the fact that you have to go in there without bringing a single microbe on your equipment. Yep. And, and I think that that really summarized the potential approach and direction of how much, much more empathetic things are potentially going to get where it's no longer like, hey, let's just land there. Let's bash everything out. Let's stick our flag. We're here, you know, where we are starting to. It's really funny. It's like it's teach that situation in my mind was like, that's a lesson how you can harness respect for a microbe on another planet that right. we absolutely don't care about here. Yeah. Right. So it's just percept it's just perspective yeah, yeah. Really. and actually so so I, just listening to you talking i can imagine people cottoning on to the the, the phrase forever technologies I mean, of course we we talk a lot about forever chemicals these days in terms of what we've done in the past has got a long legacy um but i find it fascinating this idea that we need to stretch and expand our idea of technological impacts that, that go beyond just the, the, the current time the, the current few years or the current generations and have that that respect for how these things play out over generations i think that that completely changes how we begin to think about these interactions and then as you say when you begin to put the human at the center of the the conversation rather than just say what cool stuff can we do I think things get really interesting there in a way that I don't often see. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I feel like um, 
myself and other people, you know, of, who are like kind of like minded, we just champion that as much as possible and yeah. really try to like, I think a lot of the work that I do is trying to bring back the attention and the focus on the fact that mm -hmm. if you lead with qualities first, if you lead with values first, then you end up in a very different situation, you know? Yep. Yeah, yeah, which I, I think makes absolute sense. And and so actually, as an, an aside here, so quite a lot of my work is looking at how you develop technologies responsibly and ethically. Um, but here at ASU, we've actually started looking at a, a, a parallel concept of, of principled innovation, which is all values based. Um, and just listening to you talk, I, I'm feeling connections being made in terms of how do you put sort of human values and, and what is important at the center of, of what we do and, and what we build. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, that's really great. <laughs> that's really great to hear that, 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 that is what's going on, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I hope that, I hope that through the, the sort of catalog of different types of work that I do that people are able to, you know, whether it's a, a video in microgravity or whether it's, you know, a, a, some photos of some objects that were designed, I think the, the message is ultimately the same is that mm -hmm. you just need to open your mind. You need to open your mind to possibilities. You know, no one is, no one should be shunned away from having, you know, participating in this conversation and that everyone's opinions are valuable, you know? And, and I, I think we just really need, we just really need a more kind of diverse way of thinking in this space, which yep. I think, you know, <laughs> I think it will just bear it would just bear fruits of a different kind. I, you, know? I, you know, that would have been such a beautiful place to, to end this conversation. But I do have one more question. Um, but it, it, I think no it's problem. such an important statement to make. So I we're, we're almost out of time. And I had so many things I, I wanted to talk to you about it. And, and including that in, in fact, I'm going to ask this question. Anyway, I've got a couple more questions. So one of the things that, that fascinates me talking with you, um, you've got your art, your, your, your performance, which is quite stunning. Um, and it struck me talking with you that, of course, sort of um, we talk about your prosthetic, um, your, your leg and the technology there. But when I watch you perform, it's a whole body thing. You're augmenting everything about you. Um, and I'm, this must be intentional, but I'm also really interested in how you see that intersection between how you perform and, and how you think about the future. Um, great question. You know, I think that the performances tend to be like the very tip of the iceberg and then right. you just don't really see the iceberg. You know, I think everything from every design decision to lyric to, you know, all of the curation of the kind of brands and things that I work with. I think that everything aligns in a very similar way. You know, I really firmly believe in a multidisciplinary approach when it comes to, um, you know, how we manifest and showcase all of these futuristic ideas and culture. Um, I think that, you know, for me, that's been such an important, um, it's been such an important area to sort of play in because, you know, I get to, I get to go and explore all of the latest research and all of the amazing things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And I get to convey that in a digestible you know, entertaining slash educational kind of way, right. um, which, which is really great. And, you know, I think I used to be kind of afraid a while ago that, um, you know, what does it mean? Why am I working with an avatar and then I'm working on music and then I'm working on space and, you know, but I think that ultimately, I think ultimately it's the same. It's kind of like, it's, it's a spirit and a sort of a belief that, your identity is very malleable. Your beliefs are really man val malleable. Yep. And that if you just kind of lose your mind just enough, 
you can kind of achieve the most incredible things by using the builder pl- building blocks that are around you. Yeah. And I think, you know, that that was kind of the spirit of me as a little girl, right? I just kind of thought, you know, just hearing is like, oh, no, this can't be like this. And this means that, you know, and it's just like, well, just why? You know, why does it need to be that way? So when I when I was in zero gravity during the Aurelia flight, I do think that that was like coming around the full circle, mm-hmm. you know, from being like bedridden for years to like all of this crazy, <laughs> hard, weird our experiments to just being like, oh, wow, look at that. You know, you don't need to go very far to literally be in a completely alternative reality, right? Yeah. Just nothing like, you know, where everything is completely different, you know? Right, right, <laughs> and right. You don't, right. Ha- you don't even have to be on a trip for that. <laughs> right. I, I, I love that. A, a different way of losing your mind just a little. What a, what a beautiful image there. Um, so we we should wrap up. I, I I was actually gonna ask you sort of what your sort of big far out um, vision is for the future of being human, but I'm gonna leave that because I, I think this is a great place to to stop. Just one final thing: where do people go to find more of what you do and more about you and more of what's coming down the pike? Um, yeah, sure. I mean. I, I, I would say that, you know, Instagram is a really great place to just kind of like view um, a lot of the different types of, you know, what my life is like, and what, right. what types of work that I do. Um, LinkedIn is a really great place to find me and mm-hmm. has a lot more of a structured way of collaborations, institutions, and kind of, you know, a more behind the scenes of really kind of how I work. Um, and then there's also a YouTube channel, you know, which has a lot of the sort of video content and interviews and things like that. So um, yeah, kind, yeah. Of, kind of easy to find. Great, yes, good. And and I would strongly encourage people to check out the, the YouTube channel because I, some of your stuff really is quite mind blowing. One of the things that we didn't talk about, but I love is the Rolls Royce ad, which blows me away every time I watch it. So that's a, a little teaser for people to go and search out the, the <laughs> Rolls Royce um, reel there. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you know, I I truly hope I think that um, I sometimes it feels like maybe I'm keeping it vague of what does it all really mean. Yeah. But I do think that ultimately it's down to an individual to meet wherever they are at of what does it mean to see yeah. the type of work that I do. Yeah, and to me that that's so important. That that's part of the the, the process of art. It's it's co-creation where it's the, the the viewer that brings as much to it as as the performer. Victoria, thank you so much for this. This has been a fantastic conversation. As I said, we could have gone on for a long time and I'm going to have... To, to be have continued. I, to be continued, <laughs> yes. Um, but that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to wrap up. That's it for this episode of The Future of Being Human Unplugged. Um, again, massive thank you to, to Victoria um, and a reminder to check out her work if you haven't done so already, as well as um, checking out the stuff she does, that iceberg below the, the tip. We will be back on March the 12th, just a couple of weeks away, with two more amazing guests um, to talk about scripting better futures through impact filmmaking, um, with a particular emphasis on Hollywood's role. So I have a couple of of Hollywood folks here to, to explore that. That should be a fantastic conversation. Until then, enjoy the rest of the day.